It's been a while since we've talked about anything LGBT related here on Cinema Nippon. Sure, there was the gay subtext of retaliation, but we haven't covered a whole film about this sort of thing since 2017 with Shinjuku Boys. But hey, wouldn't you know it, we've got a request for just the right type of film. So let's jump into it. Today's episode comes from one of the many suggestions of YouTube user Actini. Thanks to Actini's suggestions, we got our first look at the work of Mikio Naruse. In this episode, we'll be taking a look at another major name in Japanese film history, the one that is probably less well known in the West than Naruse. Today, we'll be taking a look at the 1964 film Manji. If our discussion coming up piques your interest, rest assured that this time around there is an officially subtitled English release of the film. In the US, the film was released by Fantoma on DVD. There's no Blu-ray release of Banji as of this writing. Unfortunately, it looks like Fantoma went out of business a few years back, meaning that the American copies of the film demand some pretty hefty prices. Manji is based on a novel of the same name by Junichiro Tanizaki first published between 1928 and 1930. Tanizaki is remembered as one of the great early 20th century writers of Japan. He was shortlisted in 1964 for the Nobel Prize in Literature, and produced a number of notable works both before and after World War II, avoiding the issues presented for some authors in the changing sympathies of the public. The 1964 version of Manji was not Tanizaki's first film adaptation, nor would it be his last, having been put to film many times by the great Kon Ichikawa. Today's film was the first of five adaptations of Tanizaki's novel thus far. There have been three other Japanese versions, released in 1982, 1998, and 2006, as well as a 1985 German production known as The Berlin Affair. As you can see, the story has maintained popularity both in Japan and abroad. When the novel was finally translated into English in 1995, its name was translated as Quicksand, which is, well, not a translation of the title whatsoever, but rather a liberal reinterpretation of the title based on the themes of the story. This language change in localization is likely due to the meaning of the story's original title, manji, which is literally the pronunciation of the kanji represented by the symbol known in English as a swastika. We'll get to this more in a bit. It's been noted by prior commentators that the original title is likely meant to draw a parallel between the four main characters of the story and the four points of a swastika, while the American name quicksand refers to the slippery, dangerous situation in which the four find themselves. The script of this initial film version of Manji was penned by Kaneto Shindo, known as the director of a number of projects in his own right, like Onibaba, Kuroneko, and Children of Hiroshima. The type of dicey relationship narrative on display was perfect fodder for director Yasuzo Masumura, one of the forerunners to the Japanese New Wave, which was in full swing at the time of Manji's release. Masumura, a dropout of Tokyo University's law program, studied film as an assistant director in Rome and as an assistant director at Daiei, working under Kenji Mizoguchi and Kon Ichikawa. Once he ascended to the role of director, Masumura remained at Daiei, putting out three or four films per year. His films regularly centered around crazy or broken individuals in systems which forced them to conform with their peers. This naturally made him a perfect precursor to the works of the new wave which followed his lead. It also meant that he was ripe for adapting a story of decadence like that in Manji. Put simply, Manji is the tale of a four-way relationship perpetrated by two couples. The female half of one couple, Sonoko Kakiuchi, in this version played by Kyoko Kishida of Woman in the Dunes, falls in love with the woman in the other relationship. This other woman, Mitsuko Tokumitsu, here played by Ayako Wakao, becomes close friends with Sonoko after a rumor spreads through their arts college that they are in a lesbian relationship. This rumor is initiated when their principal calls Sonoko out in class for drawing a picture which should be of the Goddess of Mercy, but instead bears the face of Mitsuko. The Goddess of Mercy, known in Japanese as Kanon, is a common Buddhist icon, though she was originally represented as a male in India. From the Tang Dynasty onward within China and East Asia, she has been portrayed as feminine. Kanon is known within Buddhism for her ability to appear within any of the six realms of existence to relieve the stresses of those in need. Also of note is that she is said to have limitless power a trait not common within Buddhist deities. Symbolically, it is said that anyone can become like Kanon, and that compassion can transform humans into goddesses of mercy, 
Bear this in mind when viewing Manji, as the idea of Mitsuko being a goddess of mercy is raised time and again. Kotaru, Sonoko's husband, is portrayed by Eiji Funakoshi. Kotaru is a lawyer who plays a small role in the earlier part of the film, but whose importance increases once he realizes what is going on between the two women. Meanwhile, it turns out that Mitsuko is engaged to a man named Eijiro Watanuki, who is portrayed by Yusuke Kawazu. Eijiro initially comes off as far more sinister than Kotaru, trying to insert himself into the relationship with the two women, and eventually throwing a wrench into their affair, causing, let's just say, a whole lot of drama. That's about it as far as the setup goes for Manji. After the four characters are introduced and their relationships are established, the drama plays out in a form somewhat akin to a mystery. It's actually kind of like Confessions, which we covered a while back, in that the audience can never be entirely clear about what is true and what is a lie, meant solely to force a wedge between or draw two characters together. Again like Confessions, the film ends on a note where you're left questioning just what exactly you just watched, and whether what you think happened actually happened. The main difference between Manji and Confessions is that, where each character in Confessions seemed to have at least somewhat relatable motivation, virtually everyone in Manji is unlikable. Of note with Manji is how openly it addresses the idea of a lesbian relationship so relatively early in cinematic history. As you might imagine, given the rampant cheating and lies within the film, the gay relationship on display here is not portrayed in the most positive of lights. But we would argue that how directly it tackles the relationship in the first place is a pretty big step for gay fiction in Japan. We've touched on this to an extent with our discussion of the film Shinjuku Boys and the late author Yukio Mishima, but in researching Manji, we learned the full extent of the differences in representation of different LGBT groups in Japan. As we learned, male homosexual relationships relationships are portrayed much more commonly than those of their female counterparts both in the media and in pop culture. There's a historical aspect to this, with homosexual relationships between samurai being common during the reign of the shogun. The popular attitude seemed to be that, so long as familial concerns were taken care of, by which we mean marrying a woman and bearing children to pass on one's bloodline, men were free to do what they pleased extramaritally. This was supposed to have ceased with the onset of the Meiji Restoration and the removal of the samurai's power, but even in men like Yukio Mishima, we can observe this same trend. An attitude of don't ask, don't tell is generally held with known examples of men like this who had wives and children but philandered with other men. Of course, every relationship is different, and times are changing, but we can see through the examples of Mishima, and many other male celebrities of his day being allowed to do as they pleased once their social, marital, and work lives were accounted for, that this was not a wholly uncommon situation. The attitude towards lesbianism, meanwhile, seems to maintain the idea of don't ask, don't tell, albeit in a different manner. We were able to find anecdotal evidence of lesbians in modern-day Japan forming relatively insular groups. This is done in order to protect one another's identities, as we learned that it is not uncommon for gay women to remain in the closet even to their closest friends. Thus, while for gay married men the expectation might be to simply not tell one's wife, gay women find more comfort in not telling anyone outside of their pocket communities. On both sides of the spectrum, both male and female, the attitude pervades that it is alright for fictional characters or for celebrities to be grouped within the LGBT community. As individuals, however, this is less acceptable, as it can interfere with one's marriage prospects, work and social lives, and how their family might be viewed by others. It's a tightrope that one walks when deciding how to come out and to whom one might do so. Thus, while Manji being a work of fiction means that the readers and viewers might not as readily reject it at face value as they might actually gay individuals, the anxieties embodied by the two women are very real indeed. Sonoko is something like an audience proxy in this regard, uncertain of how exactly to express her homosexual tendencies comfortably. She represents an old way of thinking, as presented by her formal dress and the trouble with which she grapples with these feelings which go against her role as a wife. Mitsuko, meanwhile, represents the conflict presented by modern and more westernized sensibilities. Though her husband turns out to be just as subversive and sly as her, Mitsuko demonstrates several times how she rejects her assumed role as his bride-to-be, shouting him down at times when Sonoko would acquiesce to her own husband. With Mitsuko dressing in western clothing, we also see this difference displayed visually. 
Through both their images and their interactions, we see that Tanizaki's tale of intrigue represents the conflicts of the early Showa period, in which the country grappled with the leftover westernization of the Meiji and short-lived Taisho periods. In Masimura's updated film version, we see how these conflicts and anxieties are transposed into a similar situation during the 1960s, after the American occupation had ended, and during which Japan had once more dealt with balancing their Japanese-ness and how much culture they drew from the West. Speaking of which, something similar is actually occurring at the time of writing this episode. Though not directly related to the contents of the film, it's of interest as a cultural note to examine why the title was changed when brought over for an American release. As we said, Tanizaki's original novel was rebranded as Quicksand when translated in the 1990s, but that's not where it stopped. With Western DVD releases, the film has either retained its original Japanese title of Manji, bearing no translation, or else it has been named All Mixed Up. Admittedly, this name pretty accurately describes the characters, but it loses the symbolic significance of the original title with swastika. As probably anyone watching this video in 2019 knows, the swastika is not exactly the most socially acceptable symbol for obvious reasons. But this symbol is one of those ubiquitous images that has actually been around for millennia, and wasn't co-opted to be as negative as it is considered today. The swastika has a long and storied past, being so old, in fact, that no one is really certain where the image originated. Similar to the spiral as we discussed in our video on Uzumaki, it appears in a number of cultures all over the globe, with ancient religious and spiritual meanings for the swastika relating to luck and well-being. The symbol is, as we mentioned before, a kanji within Japanese writing. Kanji are the Chinese characters brought over to form the third, very large writing system of Japanese, alongside hiragana and katakana. By large, we're talking thousands of unique characters, compared to the other two alphabets, 46 apiece. By extrapolation, we can glean from the manji's presence within the system of kanji. You mean, the manji kanji? Yes, the manji kanji. We can extrapolate that this means the swastika likely came to be a holy symbol in Japan by way of introduction from China. This is doubly true as the swastika is an image of great importance in the Buddhist tradition. So important, in fact, that for quite a long time, swastikas have been used to denote the locations of Buddhist temples on Japanese maps. Recently, there has been an initiative in preparation for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics to produce new maps specifically for foreigners, which replace confusing, or in the case of the swastika, potentially offensive symbols, with more easily understood ones. This has sparked a hot debate within the nation as to whether the symbol should be removed from usage at large due to its more popular connection with Nazi Germany. Given the common use of the symbol within Japan, and the differences between the religious swastika and its fascist counterpart, we can conclude that while Tanizaki's original story would not have drawn any controversy due to its age, Masumura's film adaptation might have raised eyebrows in the West due to its title. At home, however, it likely didn't affect its original audience very strongly. All of this cultural background aside, Manji remains one of Tanizaki's more popular and often adapted stories, especially in the world of film. It's an interesting early take on female homosexuality in 20th century Japan. What's more, if the version from the 1960s doesn't interest you, there's more than enough other adaptations of the story that might pique your interest based on where they hail from. Let us know below, are any of the other adaptations from Manji worth checking out? Which is your favorite? What do you think of Masumura's take on the story? Thanks for joining us everyone, and we'll see you next time as we continue our third year here on Cinema Nippon.